All right, so our first guest speaker has been working in the field of security and machine learning for seven years. He enjoys solving complex security problems like targeted attack detection, static and behavioral file script-based detection, and detecting adversarial attacks using machine learning. He is currently a senior data scientist at Microsoft Windows Defender Research Team. Here with his presentation, Hardening Machine Learning Defenses Against Adversarial Attacks, make some noise for Jugal Parikh! All right. Good morning, everyone. All right. I like how receptive you are. I think this is going to be fun. All right. So I want to open up by describing a typical day in the life of us. In January alone, 64 million people in 232 countries all around the world got hit by 48 million attacks that were never seen. Brand new, first seen attacks. What's worse? is 60% of these attacks were over within the hour. Now in security field, we talk a lot about response, cutting down that response time. But we are getting to a place where response doesn't matter. So we serve about half a billion customers, people who rely on us every single day to get this right, to be able to predict those 48 million threats at its first encounter, and it's up to us to save them. If we don't block them at the first sight, we've essentially failed. And there's plenty of attackers out there who want us to fail. They want to make us wrong. They want to defraud these innocent people and make their millions. So in this world, where response time just doesn't cut it anymore, we've turned to machine learning for its promise of proactive detection. We want to leverage its predictive power and be able to catch these threats at first sight. But just like people are susceptible to social engineering, well, machine learning is no different. Machine learning is also susceptible to adversarial attacks and to tampering. So I'm Jagal. I'm part of the Windows Defender Research Group at Microsoft. My team is called the Threat Predict Research Team. And our primary focus is to leverage machine learning to be able to correctly predict these threats. Now, a quick show of hands. How many of you here uh, use machine learning into, into their day-to-day -day lives? All right. A few hands here. So for you folks, bear with me for some time while I go through this quick machine learning primer so that everyone is on the same page. So at a very, very high level, there are two primary kinds of machine learning that we use in our team. The first one is called supervised machine learning which is where you have your malware experts and researchers create labels for entities. And now these entities are files, processes, behaviors, or a combination of them. You use these labels to identify what is good, what is bad, and to create a training data set. This data set is then fed to a machine learning algorithm, which learns several different representations from this data. And then the model that is created is used to predict unknown future data sets. Now, the second one is unsupervised machine learning. Over here, you don't tell it what's good, what's bad. You don't have any labels. But unsupervised machine learning is really good to overcome certain biases that your researchers or your heuristics might have. It's very good at clustering similar files together and surfacing those pockets of threats that maybe you might not be aware of. It groups, say, similar files together which are clean, which you haven't labeled before. It's also very good at detecting anomalies. So say, for example, you see some abnormal spikes in your telemetry. Well, anomaly detection is a great method for that. So for this talk, we are going to be talking about adversarial machine learning on supervised classification. Now, when it comes to machine learning, it can be deployed at multiple levels on your endpoint product. The two major areas where you can deploy this is on the client and on the cloud. Well, on the client, on the client, primarily along with your researcher signatures and heuristics, you want your machine learning models to be super light and super fast. So these are really good at catching things that are obvious. If the attacker is using patterns that have been known to be malicious in the past, well, client machine learning is great at that. It's also very useful to catch commodity threats, which are high in volume, 
but the attackers are in a way sloppy and they don't use heavily obfuscated techniques or they don't try to cover the attacks. Machine learning on the client is really good there. For more sophisticated attacks, we tend to move to our cloud-based models. Since they are more difficult to evade and we can see attackers testing us whenever they check our cloud-based detections. So there are multiple levels of uh, machine learning when it comes to cloud as well. The first one being the metadata based labels. So when the client examines behaviors and patterns across these different entities, and it's not quite confident that something is bad or good, it will collect those signals, aggregate them, and send it to the cloud. When I say signals, I mean thousands and thousands of attributes. The cloud takes these signals and it runs it against its arsenal of cloud-based machine learning models. These models predict what is good, what is bad, and provide a verdict within milliseconds back down to the client. And then the client can either protect the customer if it is bad, or let it run if it is good. So sometimes, if our metadata-based models don't have enough confidence, they may ask for a sample of that activity. It would work, the way it would work is, the, the metadata-based models would say, hey client, I'm not very confident that it is malicious. Why don't you upload this sample back to our cloud? Once the sample is uploaded, additional uh, attributes are extracted, attributes that are a little too heavyweight to run on the client, and then we run deep neural net models that are way too heavy to run on the client machine learning to predict whether the sample is malicious or not. So the client says, okay, I'll hold the execution of this file for a few seconds. You better give the answer to me right away. In that time, the model will evaluate the file and send out the verdict. And if it is considered as malicious, well, the execution stops. If it's not, then the execution continues running. So when it comes to real-time protection, these three layers are the major protection layers. We also have detonation-based layers where the sample is detonated in a sandbox environment. But that doesn't always give you the best results because we all know samples don't always run in a VM environment. Attackers have these anti-emulation or LOT techniques that they like to do. Lastly, we also have big database models that is collecting signals from across different components at Microsoft and trying to provide propagation of labels across the ecosystem. So this is really good for cases where, say, certain entities are not visible to the endpoint, but you see it through, say, Office 365 or Azure. These take hours and hours to get the labels, but it is still good to look at the com uh, complete ecosystem to catch the entire kill chain. So today, we're going to be focusing on the top two layers, primarily the metadata-based models for adversarial attacks. So there's a couple of pros and cons when it comes to client or the cloud. And this is really important, uh, important to understand when it comes to adversarial attacks. Because one thing when it comes to the client is if you take all your protection capabilities and you put it in the client, well, the attacker can take your client, test it forever, and try to get all the answers to their test. They can try to understand what you detect as malicious, what you detect as good. What's worse is they can figure out how you do that. Once the attackers have this knowledge, they can create new samples and try to attack users in the real world without you ever even knowing that such a test happened. So when it comes to client-based detections, there are a few exceptions. If you do have a disconnected environment, or if for some reason the client doesn't talk to the cloud, well, having some protection at the client level is still useful. But when it comes to adversarial machine learning, you are at a disadvantage. All right, on the cloud side, if you require the attacker to talk to our cloud, well, they can't do this private brute forcing. To test your protection, they will have to talk to you, which means you can see them and you can figure out what to do in response to them. If you see that certain machines are adversarial machines and they are testing your system, well, one way I could do is I would give them false verdicts or I would just play around with them to, say, to make them believe that, hey, you are evading our systems. But once the samples go on to real customers, we can start blocking. You can come up with other controls as well to know how do you prevent an adversary from doing these brute force attacks. The other benefit to when it comes to cloud machine learning is minimal client impact. So you can have a lot of heavy duty ML models on the cloud because you have a lot of compute on the cloud, which means the client can be super lightweight, no interruptions to the end user. All right, so when it comes to adversarial attacks against machine learning, 
there are four primary categories. The first one being model inversion, where the attacker can somehow guess the private features that you use to train your model by crafting special queries. The second one being membership inference, where the attacker can find out if certain attributes or certain queries were used to train your model. The third one being poisoning attacks, where the attacker can craft very careful queries to outcome unintended uh, predictions from your model. And the fourth one being, well, sorry, I messed it up. I think the third one is basically targeted misclassification, and the poisoning attacks are basically when the attacker is going to pollute your telemetry to uh, fool your models. In this talk, primarily, we are going to be focusing on poisoning attacks as well as targeted misclassification. So let me give you a quick walkthrough of the entire machine learning pipeline and tell you how each of these stages are susceptible to adversarial attacks. When it comes to the first layer, this is your sample set. This is your clean and malicious data, which you would be using for training your machine learning models. Now, if an attacker gets access to this, or even a subset of this, well, the attacker can completely flip the labels that you're training your models on. The attacker can control the ratio of clean to malware samples that you're training with. This would be very, very detrimental to your machine learning model if these go undetected. Now, when it comes to machine learning, a lot of data scientists like me tend to focus a lot more on what model should I use? Should I use a linear model, an ensemble, a deep net? I have these million parameters that I can tweak to get that added performance. But often, the sample set, that's ignored. But the way you correct your sample set, once you fix your data distribution, your labels, you make sure it is not noisy, you filter out adversarial samples, this will give you a lot more impact than any, any other model or parameters. So sample set is quite critical. If an attacker gets access to that or even a subset of that, well, the attacker can train your models. The other thing the attackers can do is they can mess with your features. So the attackers can basically figure out if the kind of features that you use, and they can try to pollute them to, in a way, confuse your classifiers, to think certain features are malicious, certain features are clean. When it comes to models, well, the attackers can craft specialized adversarial queries to fool your classifiers without you even knowing this. So these could be samples that look very benign on the surface, but it basically fools your classifiers into believing that it's malicious. Or it could be malicious on the surface, but fools your classifier to evade your detections. Say the attacker doesn't even have access to the samples, features, or models. Well, maybe what they can do is they can go to VirusTotal, they can mine your clean and malware samples and try to look at how you predict on those samples. What the attackers can do is they will train a model that learns on the predictions from your model. Once they have their own model with reasonable confidence, well, they can just craft adversarial attacks on that model and then use that against your models. A lot of machine learning algorithms have this transferability property where if you can manage to evade detections on one machine learning model, well, that, machine, that evasion would most certainly work on any other model. All right, so let's take a look at some real-world attacks that we've seen in the past. We talked about a lot of theory in the previous example. So this first example is an attack on our automation systems, which happened a couple of years ago. But essentially, the same method could be used to fool our machine learning systems. This attack, I would classify that as uh, targeted misclassification. So what the attackers did here is they took our client offline, and they started brute forcing it to guess the features that we use. They basically created very specialized malicious queries to, to see what sort of strings we detect on and what sort of strings we don't. So imagine when you have a binary that connects to a malicious IP, and this malicious IP has a string component that you determine as malicious. Well, the attackers figured out that this was the string that our engines thought was malicious, and they used this knowledge. Now, when researchers write signatures for such samples, you don't really write a signature to catch just that single string fragment. You want your signatures to be more generic. So typically, what researchers do is they would look at your PE header of the file and write a more generic signature. The attackers knew this as well. So the attackers had two different knowledge. One. They knew exactly how we write our signatures, looking at the PE header. And two, 
they knew exactly what sort of features we are latching onto to determine something as clean or malicious. Now, what the attacker did is they took a file that was from the wild, which was prevalent, which was clean. They injected that file with a malicious string in a way that the P header remains intact. And then they uploaded that file to VirusTotal anonymously. Now, like just many other vendors, we also harvest VirusTotal samples and have them processed through our automation. Well, when this file was processed, the automation found that malicious string. It knew that the sample was malicious, but when the signature writing took place, the signature was written on the clean P header of the file that was taken from the wild. So when the signatures actually hit the wild, this resulted in massive FPs, which was a disaster, not just for us, but a lot of other vendors in the AV industry. So this, the file itself that was uploaded to virus total was just a junk file. But just the fact that the attackers knew exactly what we are calling malicious and exactly how we are writing our signatures proved very detrimental. The second attack here was on our cloud-based systems. So this was an attack where attackers tried to trick our certificate, certification reputation systems into trusting signed files that were actually malicious code. So the attackers here were slightly sloppy. They were sending in a lot of traffic. Well, this telemetry got easily picked up by our monitoring systems. It got picked up as an anomaly. And since most of this traffic was unclassified, we further investigated this. What we found is the attackers, in a way, guessed the kind of features that we were using. Well, with certificate reputation systems, I think some of the features that we use are pretty common, right? Like the time, the prevalence, the traffic information, the certificate itself, and so on. So what the attackers wanted to do is they wanted to create all this synthetic telemetry so that the certificate itself gains a lot of prevalence and trick our systems into believing that this certificate is quite popular, hence we should trust it. Well, they, didn't, they, they failed in this case. What we ended up doing is we developed a complementary model with additional features that basically try to detect traffic that is coming out from these attackers. We use that model to identify this traffic and filter out this traffic from our training data. So this is how a combination of models removed attacks from our training data. All right. So these were two examples of adversarial attacks that we've seen in the past. We talked about targeted misclassification, and we talked about data poisoning. Now, previous research has pointed us to ensembles. There have been papers that say using of ensembles help us defend against these attacks, especially against poisoning attacks. So we wanted to give it a shot and see how it works. Let's look at what an ensemble is. So an ensemble is basically a stacking technique which leverages the strength of various base classifiers as their input. The individual classification model are trained based on the entire training set. Then the outputs or the predictions from these models are used as features to train the stacked ensemble. The, the, stacked, the output of the stacked ensemble is then taken as the final verdict. Now, if any of you play around with online ML competitions like Kegel, you will find that this is a very commonly known technique to get that extra edge in ML competitions. But when we take this concept and apply that to a real-world security issue, we have our own set of challenges. With security, we have to deal with active adversarial samples, where the adversaries are constantly trying to evade our detection techniques, if not attempt to directly attack us. The daily telemetry itself is continuously changing. So you see a surge in clean files one day, say a new threat family the other. The daily de telemetry distribution is highly volatile, which can have huge swings in your model performance. The data itself can be very noisy. So some of the features could be corrupt, or some of the labels could be noisy. How do you take care that this is, the model is generalizable enough to be able to deal with such noise? So let's go through the building blocks of the stacked ensemble and show you how we use this concept and put it in real world to evaluate roughly 2.3 billion queries globally every day. So when it comes to diversity, building a diverse set of base models play a very important role in not just generalizing an effective stack classifier, but also making it more robust to adversarial attacks. Now, diversity can be achieved through a lot of different things. One could be through different feature sets. 
Well, luckily in security, we already have a very high dimensional data when it comes to features. We can look at machine information like potential victim machine good, the, operation, the operating system, the system locale, and so on. We can look at static information about the potential threat like full and partial file hashes, fuzzy hashes, signer information if the file happens to be signed, and the general file geometry. We also get dynamic and contextual information like where the file was downloaded, was it connecting to a process or not, was the child-parent relationships between processes and files, if the file connected to a network, if it did, what was the URL, and so on. And then, of course, we also support custom features that the researchers can set to extract custom properties from files or processes and behaviors. So when it comes to features, the sky is the limit here. One thing to know that is really important is you have to make sure that these features are constantly changing and adapting to the threat landscape. This helps you evade feature evasion attacks. All right, let's talk about different training algorithms and different data sets. So depending on the kind of features that you're using to train your models, the data distribution itself in the data set, the noise, and the total number of instances that is used, it is highly likely that one set of algorithms perform better than the rest. The same thing happened to us. If you look at the table here, you can see that for P properties, researcher expertise, and behavioral data, the ensembles, boosted ensembles, do quite well. When it comes to, say, classifiers that operate on millions and millions of features, like 12 million, 16 million features, we see linear classifiers like the average perceptron is doing quite well. When it comes to using raw data or the raw file itself, DNNs or deep neural nets do quite well. Moreover, you can have different data sets based on client models, cloud models, as well as full file content of the models. The models themselves could be later broken down to different file types, like PE types, JavaScript, VBS, PDF, macro, and so on. The other way you can achieve diversity is by optimizing for different threat scenarios. So, 96% of the files that we see are only seen once on a given machine. If you don't block it at its first encounter, you're never gonna get a chance to block it again. So we have to get it right the first time, which means you gotta train your classifiers to adapt to this temporal bias. You wanna make sure that the classifiers are actively learning on new telemetry that you get, and let them overfit on your current threat landscape. Let them latch on to the current threat campaign and look at similar patterns exhibited by polymorphic files from the same threat family. So say, for example, you want to come up with a classifier that looks at regression. Well, maybe you want to look at a longer cadence where you train your classifiers one time a week or, say, several times a month as compared to doing several, you know, training your classifiers several times a day. Moreover, instead of having just a binary clean malware classifier, you could have classifiers focused on different types. So you can have a binary classifier that looks at malware, that looks at clean, that looks at poor files, or as I said before, you can look at different file types. Moreover, you can look at consumer versus enterprise customer specific data. You can look at vertical specific data based on the distribution that you would see across these terminals, it would make sense to maybe look at developing customized models. Maybe that would give you a better, uh, better boost. So we talked about three ways to generate different set of models, different set of diverse features. Now, how do I, see, how do I check for this diversity? How do I make sure that my feature set is actually diverse? Well, a great way to check this is by something what we call is using Pearson correlation matrix. With Pearson correlation matrix, it takes all your input and maps it to x and y axis. So in this case, all the inline-based classifiers that we generated using those combinations in the previous slides are mapped on the x and y axis. The center yellow line here shows where the exact same classifier intersects. So yellow is bad, which means it's getting the same answers for the same data set. For diversity, you want your features to be less correlated with each other. So what you want to be focusing on is this dark blue areas, which means that each of these classifiers have something unique to contribute. And these low-level signals can then be picked up by your stack classifier 
to give you a better generalizable signal. All right, so we've talked about generating the features for the stack classifier. Now, how do we develop the stack classifier itself? How do we combine these different classifiers, take a look at their signals, and come up with an overall stack classifier? There are two major techniques to develop a stack classifier. The first one being Boolean stacking. So over here, what you do is you take the binary outputs from your base classifiers as input features to the stack classifier. If you can see the, the red rectangle there, it's basically just looking at zeros and ones. And then you train that as, as inputs for your stack classifier, and you take the final prediction from your stack classifier as your final output. Well, based on our experiments, we found that this resulted in an overfit. The stack classifier wasn't even able to outperform some of our single best models. So this really wasn't a really good approach. So we tried a different approach. Instead of taking the binary labels, we started looking at the probabilities that are produced by these base models and took them as input features to, tra the, uh, to train the stack classifier. And this indeed showed us promising results. The ensemble was able to do better than some of our single best models. All right. So we looked at looking, we, we, we started training with using a logistic fashion. Now, what sort of model should we use to train the stack classifier? Should it be a linear model? like logistic regression or SDCA or average perceptron? Should we look at boosted techniques like tree-based techniques, should, like light GBM, fast tree, and so on? Or should we train a DNN? If you look at literature, literature suggests that a linear classifier like logistic regression does really good when you're combining strengths from these individual base classifiers. Well, with, when we ran our experiments, we found slightly different results. And I wanted to share that with you. Before that, let's go over the experiment setup quickly. So often we have a train data and a test data to train and evaluate your machine learning models. It's pretty much the same setup that we used here, except that we did a time-based split because there is a lot of temporal bias when it comes to security and machine learning. So we used the, the old, older data as a training data, the more recent data as a validation data, and the most recent data as a test data. So here's how it worked. The train data was used to train a supervised machine learning model. The validation data was used to tweak the parameters and fine tune the model to make sure it doesn't underfit or overfit to take care of the bias, variance, trade-off, and so on. And then the evaluation data was used as a holdout set, which was touched only once, to look at the final performance. So all the experiments that I described from now on would be using the same experimental setup. So using this methodology, we found that light GBM, which is a gradient boosting ensemble technique, really did better when it comes to picking up the stack classifier. You can see the red line down here, which indicates logistic regression. And you can see that it is reasonably comparable, but the light GBM algorithm gave us best results. The way I would interpret this is your x-axis is your false positive, and your y-axis is your true positive. The goal here is to get maximum amount of blocks with the minimum amount of false positive. So you basically want to focus on this left side right there. So the higher up you go and the further left you are, it's the best, which we see is the case with light GBM. OK. So we developed the stack classifier. We got light GBM as the algorithm. Let's see how it performs. So we tried to plot this as a comparison to see how a stack classifier is performing as compared to some of our base and line classifiers. And you can see clearly that the stack classifier here is able to gain more accuracy and robustness than any fine-tuned model can gain. OK. To quickly recap our ensemble approach, we talked about how to generate and validate a diverse set of base classifiers. We talked about how do we use model probabilities as input features to train the stack classifier. We talked about how light GBM as an algorithm helped us to train the stack classifier. And then lastly, we saw how, how we plot an ROC curve for stack classifier as compared to some of our top base classifiers. So we have the classifier. Let's try to test it and see how it performs. Models can always look great in test environment. But sometimes, when you deploy that in real world, 
well, your performance can vary. The same happened here. The evaluation metrics really looked awesome. But when we evaluated the model on 60 minutes of real-world data, well, our precision dropped from 92% to 9%. And, well, and the recall, uh, well, the precision dropped from 97 to 13%, and the recall dropped from 92% to 9%. That was definitely frustrating. So we wanted to understand why this happened. Everything looked so great, and we, you know, every, the results were so promising. We wanted to debug the model and see if we can fix some of our errors and still get a good performance. So what were some of the problems? Do you, anyone cares to guess? Something? How about in terms of the temporal split that I talked about? All right, well, let's go through the problems. So the first issue that we found was related to data leaks. So the information from our labels inadvertently made its way into the training features, which caused an overly optimistic assessment of our stack classifier performance. So in particular, what happened is some of our detonation-based models were in a way contributing to our labels, which meant that the detonation-based models had a direct correlation with the labels, and we did not see that. When the features were fed to the stack classifier, well, the classifier thought that, hey, whenever I see a positive sign from detonation-based models, I always see that the labels are malware. So this has to be a very strong feature. But this was basically just overfitting on the detonation-based models, and the data was leaking. So what we did is we filtered out these instances that correlate directly to the training labels, and we tried to run our test again. You can see when we filtered out the data leaks, we still see a 10% drop on our recall. But we felt more confident that, yes, the model is still doing quite well. It's still giving us an 82% recall, which is not too bad. The second scenario that we looked at was handling missing values. So as you can see, a lot of these classifiers are optimized to handle very specific scenarios. And not every time you would get outputs from each of these classifiers. For example, here, you can see that only two classifiers had given out a verdict, and everything else is sparse. Well, looking at this data, anyone could say that, OK, since the values for these classifiers are too low, if I combine them, well, the stack classifier should also give me a very low probability, which basically indicates that the file is not malicious. No. The stack classifier came out with a confidence of 92% saying that the file is malicious. What happened here, essentially, is the stack classifier was overfitting on these specific representations. The classifier wasn't able to identify exactly what was missing, what was there, and how do you, you know, differentiate between the two? All right, so instead of removing such features, we actually want to keep these features because that was the whole intention of using the stack classifier to look at low level signals and come out with a high signal or a high verdict. So instead of removing them, what we did is we added Boolean values to indicate which of the classifiers are present and which of the classifiers are not. And then we did a cross join across different features. So now, the model could learn on both the existence of a model result and the actual value of the result. And this helped us solve the sparsity issue. One last tweak we made to the model was we added a set of unsupervised features. So because in security we have very rich feature set, it basically helps us to segregate malware families into different threat families. And this information can be used by any of the classifiers to find certain, certain, um, to find certain similarities. So we looked at k-means clustering to cluster these files. And we looked at the cluster distance from the instance to the centroid of each of these clusters. And we took them as features to train the stack classifier. And this gave us a nice boost in our malware detection rate while keeping the false positive pretty constant. So other improvements that we made were we decided to train the stack classifier daily so that we can look at more first seen attacks. And we wanted to, 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 to make it a very active learning scenario where it is actually catching these new threats, never seen attacks, campaigns, and so on. But when, you, when it comes to training every day, 
Well, you can see a surge of malicious activity one day, a burst of new clean files the other, and maybe some specialty malware the next day. If you look at this graph, you can see that the distribution can be very, very volatile. And these huge swings in your label distribution and the type of malware and clean files that go into the training could result in huge model performance gaps if there is no control. So we added gates and controls on the training labels in order to avoid these kind of swings. We decided exactly what sort of features we want to look at, exactly how many uh, amount of instances we want to train with, and control the overall ratio. This helped us make the model more generalizable, and the, class the classifier performance was more stable over time, and it did not have huge swings. All right, so let's do some red teaming, where we look at how, how good is the stack classifier when it comes to adversarial attacks, especially targeted misclassification. So what we did here is we tried to attack some of our own systems by crafting adversarial attacks. So in this scenario, we have a P file that gets featureized into a, a binary feature vector. This binary feature vector is then fed to a model, and the model, say, classifies it as malware. What we ended up doing is we took this feature vector and we ran Jacobian-based aliency map attack, which is a very commonly known technique in adversarial attacks. So it basically just perturbs your input representation in a way that changes the model classification. So now, the file was still functional. It looked very similar. But now the feature vector was modified in such a way that the same model classified this file as clean. So what we did is we flipped the labels for two of our top classifiers. We assumed that the attackers were able to compromise, say, two of our top classifiers that get fed to the stack classifier for inference and see how much of an effect that has on our stack classifier. Well, you can see from this plot here that even if we perturb 100% of the samples, the model performance is decreasing by 30%. Well, 30% is quite large, yes, but assuming that you know, you have all your samples compromised, this is still not too bad. You still have your system up and running, and it's able to resist such attacks. Okay, so let's take a look at it from a feature space. What if the attacker starts injecting random features into the stack classifier, and what if somehow these features get into the training data stage? So in order to simulate this, we looked at our supervised training stage, and we added a bunch of random features, random classifiers as features to train a stack classifier. And we wanted to see how robust is the training mechanism. Can the stack classifier actually identify such new random features as noise, or does it start training on them? Can the attacker have an influence on the overall output? Well, it did not. You can see on the right, right there, is all the 10 random features that we added were identified by the stack classifier as being noisy. And the plot here is basically your feature importance. So the higher up it is, the better the feature for the classifier. And you can see that most of the features at the bottom are not used by the stack classifier, which means that it was able to take those noisy labels and filter it out completely, understanding that it was noisy. We also tried to look at the model performance. And you can see that when we had no random classifiers, our true positive rate was 96. And after adding, say, 10 random features, our classifier true positive rate dropped down to 95.8. Well, that wasn't too bad at all. So we looked at targeted misclassification. We looked at perturbation-based attacks and data poisoning. But what if the attacker is really, really motivated to somehow break our ensemble approach in ways we don't see coming? Well, in that case, having certain controls and mitigation across each of the stages of a machine learning pipeline is very useful. On the sample side, it's very good to control your overall number of instances. You can do smart sampling to prevent any flooding of your telemetry. You can control your label distribution that prevents stuffing of labels into your stack classifier. On the feature side, make sure that you con continuously update your features because say if the attacker is able to figure out what features you're using today, well, that's no longer going to be valid tomorrow since you're automatically updating your features. You look 
for feature evasion. And then you can add certain unsupervised learning features to make up for human bias. When it comes to models and, and its parameters and deploying them, we should be versioning the models. So if the current model goes off the rails, don't ship it. Use, use the last model that was seen and retain it in the field in production. And lastly, once the model is actually deployed, well, have some real-time monitoring. Look at the overall Brock levels. Even though you don't have labels, while the model is inferencing in the wild, look at the overall amount of blocks. Look at the changes in your blocks. Is it saying, is it having a huge spike in your malware? Is that a campaign or is that a false positive? Look at these anomalies and try to identify what is happening. If you see huge spikes that are completely out of its standard deviation, well, maybe something is wrong and we need to investigate. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the results. So as we discussed, the experiments seem to indicate that the ensemble approach gave us a really nice boost above and beyond our base classifiers. And in fact, it did. So you don't always see results that mimic what you see in experimental mode, but this approach here gave us a really nice boost. On, every, on any given month, the ensemble models are giving us anywhere from 10 to 15 percent more detection than what we were originally getting from our cloud. Now, this is a hefty chunk that sums up to roughly 9 million more threats being stopped and customers being protected. About 75% of the threats our customers encounter are often some variants of a PE file, and the ensemble models are doing quite well against them. But they are also protecting against thousands of other file types, many of them we don't even have specialized classifiers for. So it has really given us a nice boost above and beyond the base level. An unplanned benefit that we got from using the stacked ensemble approach is interpretability. So if you look at the slides that I discussed before, we had some of our classifiers that operated on millions and millions of features. Now, say if you want to interpret how a classifier came up with the verdict, what sort of features contributed to a classifier's performance. Well, if you have millions of features, it, it gets really, really complicated to interpret your models. With the stack classifier, it's operating on a very small feature set. You're just operating on the probability scores of your base learners. So it's pretty simple to see what's contributing to your ensemble models. The other benefit we got out of this is we can take a subset of threats. So let's say you have a specialized trained JavaScript classifier. Well, you can take a subset of its detections and compare it with the ensemble model and find gaps. So say if the JavaScript model is only detecting 20% of the threats in its domain that the ensemble model is detecting, well, well, maybe there's a problem with that model then. It's good that the ensemble is picking up the slack, but maybe we need to take that model and train it further to make it improve and more robust and more generalizable. So we can use the stacked ensemble approach to, in a way, also keep a check on, our, on some of our base classifiers to make sure that they are performing at par with other classifiers. So just to recap quickly on why you might consider an ensemble approach. Well, it filters out noisy signals from an occasionally underperforming model. So if you have models who are performing well or sometimes not as well, it will identify those low-level signals and give you a strong verdict. It's really good at increasing the predictive power with easy interpretability, as we could see in the previous results. And it adds resilience against attacks, as we saw on the red team side of things. All right, I'd like to show you how these ensembles have protected our customers in some real-world scenarios. So again, this is focusing on the first two layers, the client models and the metadata-based models on the cloud. So the first case study here is quite interesting, not, not because it's a huge large-scale attack, it's actually quite tiny. It affected less than 33 computers in total, and mostly located in central, in central Canada. Most of the targets were small to medium businesses. So this was a small scale, small time frame, specially targeted attack. So the way this started is with an email. It looked like an email came from a local landscaping company in Canada. So it says, hey, I've got an invoice for you, and here is the attached PDF file. So when the user opens the PDF file, you would see this docu DocuSign file that's got a link to view the actual agreement. This link 
would take the customer to a phishing site, which would then try to steal their credentials. Well, luckily, the Ensemble models kicked in here and helped us out. So how did this work in practice? So the local ML models flagged this PDF file as being suspicious. So it extracted its properties from this PDF file and sent all those attributes to our cloud-based system, where all the models ran on the metadata. You can see here on the top that our PDF classifier actually didn't quite respond. But luckily, the ensemble had looked at other model results and saw that this sort of you know, combination of low-level signals were very similar to an attack that it had seen previously, and it knew that this was malicious. So within milliseconds, it sent that malicious response back to our client and prevented the PDF file from even being open, saving that person from even clicking that link on the phishing website. Thank you. <laughs> so the second example here is on a larger scale. But it's really interesting since it's about 3,000 customers in Brazil. And every single attack was different. So it was the same campaign that was circulating this heavily obfuscated JavaScript file. But every single one of them, every single one of the JavaScript file itself, was super polymorphic. So again, this started out with an email. The email contains a zip file document that when you opened, contained a VBS file that looked like a document. If the person opened that VBS file, well, that installed a Chrome extension. None of these particular components was actually a payload. The payload, that was actually this obfuscated JavaScript file, was downloaded by this Chrome extension that was being then downloaded. Oh. You can see at the bottom the, um, the unobfuscated version of the JavaScript file there and try to understand what it was doing. It was trying to steal your credit card details and other things. Luckily, this scenario was pretty, pretty similar to other examples that I talked about. So the client picked up low-level signals from these lightweight client ML models. It said, hey, this JavaScript file looks suspicious. I'm going to send you the attributes. Why don't you analyze it? Tell me what I need to do. So the cloud ran this uh, attributes against its arsenal of inline classifiers. You can see here that our JavaScript model actually gave out a malware verdict with a little over 50% confidence. Well, luckily, the stacked ensemble helped us here as well. It looked at these low-level signals and said that, hey, I've seen these patterns before. I know that this is malicious. So it gave out a malicious verdict in milliseconds with a high 90% confidence and blocked the file from being executed. All right. I'd like to thank everyone who helped us on this project. It really takes the village to come up with a concept, to prototype it, and push it into production to see real-world results. So I know I talked quite a bit. But if there is four things that I want you to take away from this presentation is client-based machine learning is susceptible to brute force attacks. Whenever you design your protection, keep that in mind. Build a diverse set of complementary models and then add an ensemble layer on top of it. So the complementary models can attack different threat scenarios, and the ensemble would then combine these signals and give you a stronger verdict. Consider various vectors of the attack. Identify the most likely vectors that, might, that your environment might be more vulnerable to, and test them. So look at all the stages of the machine learning pipeline, from samples to features to models to deployment. See exactly how you're how you're vulnerable, and try to test yourself against it and defend yourself against it. And after you deploy your models, ensure that you have monitors to alert on potential tampering events. So you want to make sure that the model is sane enough and doesn't go crazy out there in the field. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. So we have 90 seconds if anyone wants to ask some questions. <laughs> we have more time than that. <laughs> There's at least one good uh, question in here. So Michael Sparks? Starks, sorry. Have, you asked a really great question on Twitter. You should follow it up. So go grab a mic. 
And if you guys have questions, also, by the way, so for those who don't know, not only are we recording it, obviously, for us, but we're streaming this for our, our international staff. So I want to give a quick shout out to Johnny Schnicker in Dublin, who's watching this, and uh, also David Sandoval in Mexico City, and of course, our security operations staff who's in there. They're making sure that we don't have any fires today and everyone's safe and secure and all of our stores are still working the way they need to be. We have a bunch of those people that are, can't be in this room that are also streaming. So go ahead and ask your question. So you mentioned that the machine learning models can be impacted, the performance can be impacted by attackers. So do we have uh, new avenues to worry about for effective denial of service techniques and how would you address those? Sure, so denial of service is also one of the kind of attacks with adversarial attacks. Um, so what if the attacker somehow finds a way for your client to not even connect to the cloud? I would put that more towards security operations so you want to make sure that the product, you, know, you basically follow your standard SDLC approach to make sure that you know, the DOS attacks on the client doesn't happen. But my focus here was more on, say the connection is good, can the attacker actually communicate to the cloud and cause your cloud verdicts to give out unintended outcomes in a way that you don't expect? And how do you, threat, you, know, how do you model your threat uh, landscape against that? So. Okay, I got a question for you sure. guys, for the audience. Who can define what an ensemble is after listening to that talk? Anybody? Jump over the mic. First person to do it. No pressure. No pressure at all. An ensemble um, is a layer on top of uh, your complementary models that work together to determine whether or not something might be malicious. Good nice. Yeah. All right, give him a round of applause. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Well, so, that makes me feel good. Not everyone was sleeping, so that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. How many people learned stuff about machine learning they didn't know today? Like, everybody. Nice. Yeah, good. <laughs> so that's, that's a good measure. Uh, we like to do crowd interaction. We had a couple of good tweets while you are talking, so to call out a couple of them real fast. Sure. Um, obviously, my, my personal favorite this session, Michael, was your uh, widely distributed certificate comment, which was uh, a widely distributed certificate does not necessarily mean it's a trustworthy certificate. I love that, the subtlety and the nuance of that. Uh, uh, by the way, for our, the ones, these tweets that we pick out, we have prizes for you. I don't have them at this moment, but we will have them this afternoon. You guys will see them and you'll, you'll want them. So participate. So see me later. Okay. Um, James Bell, uh, for uh, obviously the, the machine learning I caused you to stumble, but to keep going. James, where are you? I know I saw you there, right there. Yeah, thank you. That was a great tweet, if you guys see that one. And then Kenneth Moon. Okay, so what day is it? May the 4th. We had our first Star Wars reference. Nice. Does anyone see that tweet? It was, um, hold on, I got, I got, I'm going to botch it, so I have to actually like, pull it up. Help me, help me, help me. It was the, 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 the machine learning wars have begun, but in Yoda speak, but I can't, obviously I'm vouching it right now. But anyway, you win, so come find me afterwards, all right? So everyone, round of applause. Thank you very much, Dougal. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it.